You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. The hair-raising adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. It's me, Effie. Oh, Sam, I've been worried about you. Sid Weiss was just on the phone, and he says digging up a corpse without a permit is against the law. It's all right, Effie. I just dug him up to say hello and put him back again. Oh, Sam. I'll be down in a couple of minutes to dictate my report, sweetheart. If I get lost on the way, you'll find me in City Hospital, the psycho ward, third straight jacket from the left. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented each week by Wild Root Cream Oil, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that will put your hair back in place again, grooming it neatly, naturally, the way you want it. Fellows... If a girl can spend half an hour under a hot dryer in a beauty parlor to look her best for you, certainly you can spend half a minute sprucing up with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic to look your best for her. Now, that's all it takes, and Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, the way girls like to see it. Besides, it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. It contains lanolin. So get the big economy size bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Date, August 2nd, 1946. To Mrs. Gregory Denov. Subject... Death of Dr. Denov. I was sitting in my office with nothing to think about except a horse named Corkscrew Jr. My secretary, Effie Perrine, came in and said there was someone outside. I didn't look up from the dope sheet, so she said it again. Someone outside, Sam. What's he look like? Um, blue double-breasted custom-made suit, count of Maratai, hand-tailored shirt, English shoes, hand-trimmed Van Dyke. Get me a blank check and send him in. Okay, Sam. Please come in. Mr. Spade will see you now, sir. Thank you. You, you are Mr. Spade, Sam Spade. What can I do for you? I'm Dr. Gregory Denov, a psychoanalyst. I, I need your help. Lie down, doctor, and tell me all about it. <laughs> I, I see you might also be noted for your sense of humor as well as your discretion. Who told you I was discreet? A man named Nicolaitis. Well, you tell Nicolaitis, I think he's cute too. What else does he say about me? That I can trust you with $10,000. Oh. Is this Mr. Nicolaitis one of your patients? No. No, he isn't. As a matter of fact, he... He's gotten possession of some private records of mine. Well, it, it's rather involved. Nicolaitis is shaking you down, and he picked me as the middleman. Is that it? This is not an ordinary case of blackmail. Blackmail is blackmail, even if you do it in technicolor. Well, as you may know, a psychoanalyst keeps a faithful transcript, a detailed record of everything a patient says during consultation, no matter how intimate or shocking... Yeah. This man, Nicolaitis, has managed to gain possession of a copy of one of these case histories. The patient is a very celebrated person, and should this material be divulged, it may have very serious consequences for both my patient and, and for me. Doctor, your best bet's the San Francisco Police Department. No, no, that's out of the question. Then I'm afraid I can't help you. Why not? Nicolaitis said I'm that I'm a private you're... detective. When I take on a client, I take on his troubles. My job is to protect him, not to stand by and see him milked. You want to hire me on that basis, I'll listen. Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. I must trust somebody. What can you do for me, Mr. Spade? Write me out a check for $1,000. Get a pen? Yeah. All right. You see, Nicolaitis figures that if I'm getting a cut, I'll have to keep my mouth shut. I'll spend it all the same. 
Here you are. Thanks. Now, uh, what was the last thing Nicolaitis told you? That he would pick up the $10,000 here and deliver to you this file in question. Can you reach him? Yes. Call him. Tell him you've seen me. Tell him I won't do that kind of business in my office. Tell him to come to your house. I'll be there. What if he refuses? He won't. Tell him I have the whole 10000 What time? How about in an hour? No, no, I'm sorry. We'll have to make it around three or... Oh, goodness, I'm late now. I, I really... That's a beautiful watch, Mr. Denham. Yes. Foreign? Uh, yes. May I see it? My watch? Why, oh, really, Mr. Spade, I'm very late. I have so many things to do, and I have to be at the Majestic Theater well before the matinee starts at 2.30. Are you going to see me at 3 o'clock if you're going to the theater? Oh, I'm not going to stay for the performance. Well, Mr. Spade... Till 3 o'clock, then. Oh, my office is in my apartment. The address is here on my card. It's the penthouse. Penthouse, huh? Okay, doctor, I'll come formal. I'll wear the top to my bathing suit. I left my office around 2.30 and started walking up Knob Hill. The Versailles apartments where Denov's place was took up the whole 300 block, so I didn't have any trouble finding it. I stopped across the street for a minute to get my breath after the uphill climb, mopped my face, and started across. Just as I got to the middle of the street... The crowd was packed in so close around, I couldn't see who'd done the Brody, but I had a pretty good idea. The cops had the sidewalk roped off and guards posted at the building entrance. It took me maybe 20 minutes to elbow my way through and show my credentials. Sergeant Levine had the front door, so they let me in. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide met me at the door of the penthouse. Hiya, Sam. What do you want? I want to see Dr. Denov. The doctor's dead. Dead? Yeah. He's my client. They can't do this to me. How? Hit a Brody out the window. What are you here for? To see his wife. Okay with you? Why not? She's inside. Thanks. Mrs. Danoff, please. With all due respect for your grief, I must have the keys to the cabinet where Gregory kept his confidential files. You realize that he wished me to take charge of his patients and that I am responsible. All this police and so on. We must get those files out of here as soon as possible. <clears throat> yes? My name is Spade. I am Dr. Zoya. I was poor Dr. Denoff's oldest friend. If there's anything I'd like to I... see you, Mrs. Denoff, alone. <laughs> but you police have already asked her so many questions. You see, she's not in the... I'm not with the police. I'm a private detective. I was working for Dr. Denoff. A private detective? He was in trouble, you see. You see, Dr. Sawyer, the police won't believe me. Mm. Mr. Spade, you'll tell them. You're telling me he didn't commit suicide. Well, Mrs. Denov, I guess that takes care of everything here. It's clearly suicide. Oh, idiot, blind, stupid idiot. Suicide. Mm. My husband, he treated suicides. He would never... No, please, it will be all right, my dear. I'm sorry. She's hysterical. Yeah. If I had the time, I would... Tell them, tell them. Please, Mrs. Denov. The undertaker has been arranged for a burial at 7 o'clock, Beit Israel Cemetery. Now, please, the key to Gregory's files. Here, take it and go. Go ahead, all of you. Okay, we'll, we'll not call you later. No, me. I'm so sorry, gentlemen. This hysteria, a simple traumatic condition. If I only had the time. Oh, who can I turn to? Who will help me? You think it's pleasant? You think my husband would rest if they said I committed suicide? What shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? Oh, oh you... Dr. Zoya didn't have the time, neither have I. You think it's murder? Who do you think killed your husband? To name someone? That's a very serious charge, Mr. Speed. Goodbye, Mrs. Denov. Constance Brent. You mean Constance Brent, the actress? Yes. Well, she was his last patient this morning. She had threatened to kill him before. How do you know? My husband said so. To you? Well, he'd, he'd written it down on his notes on her case. Once before, she'd almost pushed him from that same window. How about your husband and Miss Brent? Oh, I knew she was falling in love with my husband. That always happens. They, they call it a transference. But in this your case... Your husband told me Miss Brent was acting in a play this afternoon over at the Majestic. Yes, Midsummer Night's Dream. But she was here. I know she was here. Miss Ray, the receptionist, was coming back from lunch when she heard voices arguing inside. 
And she was sure it was Miss Brent's voice. Show me the doctor's case history on Miss Brent. I can't. It's missing. As soon as it happened, I went to the files. I meant to show it to the police. Who could have taken it? Constance Brent was the last one in that room before he died. Yeah. When did you see Nicolaitis last? Nick who? Skip it. Uh, where can I reach you in case... For the next couple of hours, I'll be at the Majestic Theater. I want to see how good an actress this Constance Brent is. Constance Brent's dressing room? What do you want? I want to talk to Miss Brent. Well, you can talk to me. I'm her husband. So you're Mr. Brent. I'm Jonathan Wallace. She's Mrs. Wallace. Now, what do you want with my wife? I've come to tell her that Dr. Denhoff is dead. D- uh, are you sure? You try falling from a 12th floor window sometime. Well, that's the best news I've heard this year. But I'm afraid it'll be a shock for Constance. Maybe, maybe not. She was the last person to see him alive, as far as anybody can make out. Uh, are you from the police? No, uh, I'm from the insurance company. Claims investigator. What do you want to see Constance for? The policy wasn't made out to her, was it? No, made out to his widow. But she can't collect. Police say it was suicide. <gasps> that settles it. This is the last time I play Titania. Stand around while Puck talks his head off. Who is this person? Darling, I'm afraid this is going to be a shock. This man is from an insurance company. Dr. Denov is dead. Oh, what a pity. What happened? The police say he jumped. His wife says he was pushed. She also says that you, Miss Brent, might have been the pusher. Oh, now, really, it's too absurd. How like a wife. What time did your play start this afternoon, Miss Brent? Matinee at 2.30, always. Always. And the late lamented Dr. Denov jumped at 3 o'clock. I didn't say he did. Doesn't this news uh, shock you? But of course. Do you think good psychoanalysts are easy to find? Looks like your next doctor will have to start from scratch. Your case history seems to be missing from Dr. Denhoff's files. Missing? No. What is it? Has a man named Nicolaitis been in touch with you? I've never heard of him. Chances are you will. Does he have Dr. Denhoff's notes on my case? Could be. (gasps) This is frightful. Hot reading, huh? You seem to know this person, Nicolaitis. Get that file for me and I'll pay you well for it. Just a minute, my lovely Titania. We... We don't know who this man really is. He might even be Nicolaitis himself. Let me see your company credentials. Now, what do you know? Somebody picked my pocket. My wallet's gone. I thought so. All right, you tell me who you are. I'll call the police. Oh, no, no, Jonathan. No police. Let's get off the merry-go-round. My name is Spade. You'll find me in the phone book under S. My office is open until 6 o'clock. And if a man answers, don't hang up. It'll be me. You found a Nicolaitis yet? Not one. I even tried spelling it backwards. <sighs> Nobody ever heard of a man named Nicolaitis. I'm beginning to think there ain't no such person. Pardon me. Uh, do I hear my name mentioned? I'm Nicolaitis. Sam, I still think you're right. Come all the way in, Mr. Nicolaitis. Sit down. Oh, thank you. If you need me, Sam, just scream. What can I do for you? Oh, I've come for my money. What money? The ten thousand dollars. You remember the ten thousand dollars? Refresh my memory. Oh, Doctor Denhoff, the gentleman who visited you this morning. Oh, uh, that ten thousand dollars. Oh, you see, you see, you remember now. Yeah, yeah, it all comes back to me now. Uh, you were supposed to deliver something for the money. I think Doctor Denhoff is dead. That is no longer important. You will give me the money, please, and I will not disturb your afternoon any further. Suppose I refuse. Oh, that would grieve me. In my grief, there's no telling what I might do. Dr. Denhoff's dead. There's nothing more you can do to hurt him. Oh, never would I attempt to hurt poor Dr. Denhoff. But in my sorrow, it would be so great if I should be forced to hurt the woman he lost. After all, as Titania says, these are the forgeries of jealousy. Sonia, huh? Ah, yes, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Act One, Scene 18. (laughs) A 
I'm a little rusty on my Shakespeare. Oh, you are indeed, Mr. Spade. Titania doesn't appear until well into Act Two. She doesn't, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. I guess she isn't on for 40 minutes or so. Yes, indeed, Mr. Spade, but I didn't come here to discuss drama. What else have you got to discuss? When Dr. Dunhoff died, your market died with him. That is a very unprogressive view, Mr. Spade. There's always a gentleman named Jonathan Wallace. Why, you fiend. You don't mean you'd sell to both of us. Mr. Spade, how can you have such a low opinion of me? I will prove my integrity. I will give you the material. You give me the money. Hand it over. In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. He who goes too close to the bear soon loses his beard. I have left my beard at home. Okay, I'll meet you anywhere you say, anytime you say. Excellent. At seven in your apartment? Hmm? Won't that be walking into the bear's cave? In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. Private dicks do not kill people in their own apartment. <laughs> It was then 6 p.m. I called Effie for messages. She told me that you had been phoning frantically, Mrs. Denov. I still had maybe 30 minutes before Nicolaitis was due at my apartment, so I breezed on up to your place on the hill. We had a very interesting chat, uh, remember, Mrs. Denov? Looking back on it, that was probably the most interesting conversation we had. Funny, I can't remember much of anything you said, but it was so uh, cozy there in your place. And what with your clock being about 20 minutes slow, it must have been something like half past seven before I left you. I grabbed a cab and told the hacky to step on it. I hoped Nicolaitis was still waiting at my apartment. He was. <laughs> Mr. Nicolaitis, I'm sorry to be late. I... was lying on my bathroom floor. The little guy was looking just about as natty as when he'd been in my office, except that the beautiful silk scarf he'd been wearing was twisted into a tight noose around his neck. Mr. Nicolaitis was a very dead blackmailer. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the fourth in a new series of programs bringing to the air for the first time... The Adventures of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Men at the racetrack, the man who has something better than a mere hunch is said to have it straight from the horse. Of course, that's a humorous expression. But it shows how to get facts. Go straight to the real source of information. And that's why we went straight to hundreds of men in metropolitan New York to find out what men really want in a hair tonic. And their answers show that Wild Root Cream Oil has all five advantages chosen by this impartial consumer jury of men. One, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, never leaves it sticky or greasy. Two, Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness. Three, it removes loose dandruff. Four, it's non-alcoholic. And five, it contains soothing lanolin. Remember, no other leading hair tonic gives you all five of these important advantages. Is it any wonder that four out of five users in a nationwide test preferred Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics they'd tried? So next time you visit your barber, ask for Wild Root Cream Oil and get the big economy-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now, back to Sam and Psyche. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. His eyes were open, and he seemed to be looking right at me as I bent over him. The finger marks in his throat were too blotchy to be of any use. Pretty soon, Lieutenant Dundee and Sergeant Polehouse came in and walked over behind me. We all stood there for a second, and then Polehouse bent down and closed those eyes. You know him, Sam? His name is Nicolaitis. That's all I know about him. What did he come here to your place for? I don't know. You invited him? 
I wouldn't have been surprised to find him here, but not like this. You boys got a smear on him yet? Sure, he's an old customer of mine. Runs a photo lab, photostats, microfilm. Microfilm. Nobody makes any sense. They're all screwballs, psychos, neurotics. What am I doing in the middle of this anyway? Sam, don't scream at us. We're just doing a job. Oh, I'm sorry, boys. This Dr. Denov was my client. Mental and I was... expert. That Denov probably had a screw loose somewhere and needed a psychoanalyst himself. Say, maybe he was... Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, Dundee. Hmm? I'm going out of here now. Do I call Sid Weiss and we go through all that again, or are you going to let me walk? Why, Sam, you can go. I know where you sleep. I'll wake you when I'm ready for you. Well, Mr. Speed? I want some answers, Dr. Zoya, and you're the guy who can give them to me. I'm listening. Just let the questions flow into your mind and do not try to repress any of them. Speak instantly, whatever... Okay, question number one, without thinking. Do you think Dr. Denhoff was a suicide? Well, I had not seen Dr. Denhoff for many years. He had been my student in Vienna. I was his analyst, in fact. That's all very interesting, Doctor, but my question... Yes, yes. Uh, did poor Dr. Denhoff commit suicide? I have reviewed all the material, manifest and hypothetical, and I came to the conclusion, no, no, it was quite impossible. You see, these paranoid... Okay, and question number people. two. Was uh, Dr. Denhoff in love with Constance Brent? I suppose I can now answer that question. When I arrived in San Francisco, I found him in great distress. He told me he feared he was losing his objectivity... Towards this patient. In other words, he was in love with her. Yes. You think she might have murdered him? All psychoanalytical subjects develop aggressive feelings toward the doctor. <laughs> Nearly all of my patients have threatened me at one time or another. You don't say. Uh, tell me, Dr. Zoe, you know anything about Jonathan Wallace, Miss Brent's husband? A violent type, almost psychotic. Yeah? How about you, uh... Dr. Zoya, could you have done it? That is a most interesting question, Mr. Spade. When I arrived here from Vienna without funds, dependent on the kindness of my former students, I must confess that I felt a certain antagonism. It disturbed me to realize that a man of my standing in the profession should have be dependent on the goodwill of a younger and, uh, I sincerely believe, less gifted man. However, I overcame this, and I didn't kill him. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Doctor, thanks a lot. Oh, people, people. Truly a life study. There is no accounting. <laughs> For instance, Dr. Denhoff. He came to me only this afternoon with the strangest request. Yeah? He gave me the gold watch. The gold watch which I had presented to him many years ago upon his graduation in Vienna. He had a patient waiting and so had not much time to explain. Where is this watch? Please, I'm coming to that. He asked me to promise that I would have the watch buried with him if something should happen. That has been done. But Dr. Denhoff just died at 3 o'clock. It is a mosaic law that the deceased be buried before sundown. Uh -huh. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks a lot. Hmm. I hope I've been of some help. Doctor, you'll never know how much you've helped me. Spade. Oh, what's happened? I think I got the answers, Mrs. Denhoff. That file on Constance Brent. Your husband knew that you'd been going through it. Oh, Mr. Spade. Shut I... up and listen to me. He took it out of the files, had it microfilmed for his own private records, and destroyed the original. Really? The man who did the microfilming was Nicolaitis. He delivered one print to your husband and kept another for himself. He was murdered in my apartment for the copy he used to shake down your husband. 
The killer now has that copy, if it hasn't already been destroyed. But we can still put our hands on the first strip of microfilm, which you delivered to your husband. This is astonishing. How? It's in the gold watch, which was buried with him. Uh, oh, the, the watch that Dr. Zoe... That's right. Denov made up his mind that whatever he knew about Constance Brent was going to go to the grave with him. What are you doing tonight? Uh, nothing. And we got a date, sweetheart, you and I. I'll be back toward the wee hours. All paths lead to the grave. Ophelia, Act 6. Gregory's grave? But shouldn't we get a court order and have it done properly? The courts don't open until 10 in the morning, sweetheart, and Lieutenant Dundee's going to start asking me some questions about that stiff in my apartment before then. You see, baby, I can't wait. We shouldn't be doing this. If I'm wrong this time. It won't be wasted effort. I'll crawl into the grave myself and pull it in after. Here. I struck it. Give me that crowbar, Mrs. Denoff, quick. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Put that flashlight in, sweetheart. You look the other way. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Look. What, Mr. Speed? What have you got? The watch. Here, put the flash on it while I open it. Uh, here's my nail file. Pry off the back. Thanks, that does it. Here's, here's, here's the film. All right, Mr. Spade. Give me that film. Who wasn't the second gravedigger from Hamlet, Mr. Constance Brent? Stop clowning and hand it up to me. You better do as he says, Mr. Spade. We've both got guns. I was expecting that. It took you a long time to get here, Mr. Wallace. How did dear Constance make out as Lady Macbeth? Just give me that film. Stop being an idiot, Wallace. The cemetery is crawling with cops. Put that gun away before you drop it and break your foot. Come up out of that grave, Spade, or you'll stay there forever. Okay, Dundee. Oh. Get those hands up, everybody. Go ahead, Dundee. Make the pinch. Okay. Sam Spade, I arrest you for body snatching violation of graves under the civil code number... No, two. you fool. You're supposed to arrest Mrs. Gregory huh? Denov and Jonathan Wallace for the murder of Gregory Denov and Pericles Nicolaitis. But I... Oh, yeah, yeah. I... No, you don't. I... It was smart of you, Mrs. Denov, to make me late for my appointment with Nicolaitis. You did that so that Wallace could nail him in my apartment for the microfilm. You thought you could use that film to pin Denov's murder on Constance Brent. But after your late husband caught you tampering with his files, he added a few well-chosen words to it so that the film put the finger on you and your boyfriend, Mr. Wallace, in case anything happened to the doctor. So Wallace had to kill Nicolaitis. You weren't smart to push your husband out the window. That looked like suicide. You might have gotten away with it, Mrs. Denov, if you'd bashed your husband's head in with a bottle. Uh, that reminds me, Effie, pour me a drink. Is that all? Sign it, put a special delivery on it, and send it care of the matron to Hatchapi Prison. Go on, have one yourself. Oh, thank you. Here's half. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to it. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. Wild Root Cream Oil presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective produced and directed by William Spear. Then, on these warm August days, the sun beats down on your hair, may leave it looking dry and brittle. That's why, now especially, you need Wild Root Cream Oil. This grand non-alcoholic hair tonic has just what it takes for summer grooming. It contains lanolin, the soothing oil that's so much like the oil of your skin. Wild Root Cream Oil keeps your hair neatly in place, gives it the handsome, successful look that helps you get ahead on the job. And Wild Root Cream Oil removes loose, ugly dandruff and actually relieves annoying dryness. So tonight, take the famous FN test. Check your scalp. Signs of dryness or loose dandruff tell you, you need Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Fred Essler was Dr. Zoya. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Don't forget, next Friday, the three masters of the art of hair raising, Dashiell Hammett, William Spear, and Wild Root Cream Oil, join forces to bring you another hair-raising adventure with Sam Spade. 
Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Dick Joy speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Effie? 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 Oh. I waited. Say what you have to say and I'll go. You've been through a tough time, sweetheart. Well, you didn't make it any easier. You think it was a cakewalk for me? You think my nerves are made of rubber? You have no nerves. You're just a cold, callous Shut old up. detective. You're going to listen to me. You're going to sit still, not talk, and listen. I when can't... I've finished, you can say goodnight or goodbye. But first, you're going to listen to me. You remember how it started? Yesterday evening, when you told me it was your mother's birthday, you were giving a party, you said, and you wanted me to come? I tried to beg off being no social butterfly, but Mom would be hurt, you said. And so the next thing I knew, there I was at your house, surrounded by two dozen strangers, ten gallons of lemonade, and your mother. I've been wanting to have a talk with you, Mr. Spade, about Effie. I can't think of a nicer subject, Mrs. Perrine. <laughs> Effie is just so devoted to you, Mr. Spade. Yeah, well, uh, I, uh, mother. I'm very devoted to Effie, too, mother. Mrs. Perrine. Uh, what I mean is mother, that... I think we should Something's already dying on its feet. Oh, you want me to spike the lemonade, Effie? It just so happens that I have here in my pocket a bottle of... Uh... I have a wonderful idea. It'll make the party one big, happy family. You just wait and see now. Quiet! Quiet, everybody! What's she up to? Some kind of game, probably. Mother's great on game. Oh, that's all I need. Your attention, please! Oh, oh, excuse me, there's Miss Bren going now. Miss Bren? Oh, Miss Bren? Yeah, Mrs. Green. Won't you join the party? I'd love to, but I have an appointment. Oh, what a shame. Oh, do stay. Thank you. Some other time. Oh, Lola's so nice. She rents the sitting room upstairs. I wish she could have stayed. Well, but I I'll explain the game now. Oh, Mrs. Green, I think I'll stay after all. Oh, how nice. Oh, you've brought a gentleman friend. Yeah. Yeah, he... This is Marty. Marty? Oh, but Marty, I'd like to... Lola have sat down and crossed her legs at me. In her left knee, where I would have preferred to see a dimple, I saw a tattoo mark. Her gentleman friend, Marty, was a small, stocky guy, all teeth and New York tie. He uh, shook hands all around, and it felt like the fall of a stale stiff. And this is Mr. Spade. He's the private detective that he works for. Lola's from Kansas City, Mr. Spade. Oh? She's waiting for her husband to return from service overseas. I'm glad he's coming home safely. Where's he stationed? Uh, here. Japan. Yeah, he's... Now, quiet, everybody, quiet. We're going to play charades. Oh, it's very simple. Now, you see, I'm the captain of Team A. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Burson, oh, he's so clever. He can be captain of Team B. Now, dear, quiet, everybody. Now, we'll both select the members of our team, and then um, each of you will uh, write something on a slip of paper. Uh, we'll write a quotation or a phrase, you know, the title of a song, whatever you like. Doesn't matter. Just something interesting and clever. Then I think. Yes, yes, I think that's right. You act out what you've written all in Panama. No words can be used, although sounds are permissible. Dears, you must listen to me or we can't play the game. Now, you can't play unless you know how. Okay. And then your team must guess what is written on the paper, and you act it out. Now, any questions? How many words can we play? Oh, any amount of words. Oh, no, not, not over ten, though. Ten. Ten. Too long, yes. Now, everybody... Teams ready? were chosen. I wound up on now, Mrs. Perrine's Team A. The slips of paper were handed out to the guests. I wrote down, quote, the raven nevermore. So I'd have to make like a raven. While everybody was getting settled, uh, Lola Brent came up to me. She pushed a slip of paper into my hand. This is your charade, Mr. Spade. Oh, but I got Isn't this one. fun? Please, don't lose the charade I gave you. And with that, she lost herself in the crowd. I pushed the paper she handed me into my pocket without looking at it. 
Her gentleman friend, Marty, the little character with a New York tie, was out in the center of the floor quack, acting quack, his charade. Quack, quack, quack. He flapped his arms quack, up and down, quack, quack, quacked twice, and rolled over on his back. Nobody got it, so he did it again. Quack, 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 quack. Wait a minute, I'll pigeon. Duck, dead duck! Dead duck! Dead duck! Dead duck! Oh, isn't that wonderful? Now, Team A scores a win there. Let's go on, please. Well, sir, uh, Mr. Dead Duck, we guessed you. So will you please get up now and we'll go on to the... Oh! oh, oh Sam! Sam, he's dead! And he certainly was. A deader duck I'd never seen. I bent to him and his lips were turning blue. Somebody had spiked his last drink with a jigger of poison. One hour later, Dundee and the homicide boys, including the medic, had taken a sip downtown. No one could identify him. Lola Brent had brought him to the party, but she'd taken a powder. You and Mom were kind of shaky, so I decided to spend the night on the sofa in the living room. I only used up about three hours of it when I heard the front door open. I figured it was Lola. I got to my feet, crossed to the hall, and found myself staring into the biggest 45 I ever saw. Where's the duck? Who? He wants to know who, Poby. Look, we don't want no trouble. You're protecting this duke. Okay. All we want is the duck. Try Walt Disney. Oh. I should have known they had no sense of humor. The butt of the gun caught me behind the left ear. That's where it usually catches me. I don't know how much more sleep I packed away until I felt you shaking me. Sam! Sam! Huh? What, Effie? They took Mom. Huh? Those gunmen, they took Mom. Well, what happened? They came into our bedroom. Yeah? They hit me. What? Right here. Yeah. And then they grabbed Mama. <laughs> they wanted the duck. Huh? Say, what were they saying? And they took Mom out with them. I'll call the police. Effie, no, no. But they've got Mom. Oh, for heaven's sake, Sam. They took my mother with them. No, no, we can't call the police, Effie. Not yet. They, they want something. They want the duck. I think Mom has it. Well, she's safe for a while, but if we call the police, oh, she's... Oh, Sam, Sam, what shall we do? What shall we do? Keep our fingers crossed and play the rest of the caper by ear. So you promised that you wouldn't call the police until I gave you the nod. I went out to buzz the town. I figured it was an out-of-state mob, probably New York. The Gunzels were after the duck. Well, that made no sense. They thought I was the muscle for the juke joint. I hustled over to Jenny the juke. If she didn't know the score, nobody would. Her place was dark. And finally, she opened up and led me into the rear. When I mentioned the duck, she shut down tighter than a clam in December. It's blisters, Sam. Blisters, I tell you. This ain't only the local law. This is the feds. Go away, Sam. My joint ain't juking for the duration. Listen, Jenny, there's an out-of-state mob. They put the arm on my secretary's mother. She don't know the time of day. They pulled the wrong feather. I don't hear a word you say, Sam. They're mixed up in the juke joint, Griff. You, you know who they are. Where's the duck, Jenny? Sam, you're winging in the breeze, Now, Sam. give me a rundown, Jenny, or I'll tear your ears off. I want that old woman back safe. You can't muscle me, Sam. You know why? Because you'll tear my ears off, and that's where you'll stop. <laughs> that's where they begin. Okay, Jenny, okay. One thing. Can you get word to them? Uh, maybe. Well, you try. Maybe. Tell them I've got the duck. I'll deal for the old woman. I'll try. Go back to your office. If I can throw a little weight, you'll get a call. If I can't, you can come back for my ears. And when I got back to the office, I had you on my hands. And that was no rest cure. But I can't just sit here. Do something. We've got to sit and wait. Maybe they're killing her. Maybe... Oh, Sam, please, call the police. No, we got to sweat it out. I can't. I can't go on like this. Who sent you? Jenny the Duke. What's your name? I'm Dennis O'Rourke. I'm here to talk about the duck. Good enough. Come into my office. Effie, you wait out here. But Sam... Wait here, I said. Sit down. Thank you kindly. I'm a lawyer, Mr. Spade. I'm here to represent my client. What's his name? John Doe. Mm-hmm. Jane Doe's big brother, huh? My client has been led to believe that you are prepared to uh, produce the duck. Is that correct? More or less. What's it worth to your client? My client is willing to trade the old woman for the duck. <laughs> you go back and tell your client I'm a big boy now. Well, I, uh, 
I don't understand, Mr. Spade. This town is loaded with old women. All I have to do is walk up and down Market Street, but there's only one duck. Yeah, there must be a misunderstanding. Well, let me put you straight. I've got the duck. Where? Oh, don't be cute. Your client wants the duck. Okay. For 50 G. $50,000, is it? Yeah, things are high all over. Yeah, but the old woman is uh, Mrs. Green. Aren't you interested? Ah, listen, you can do whatever you like about the old woman. So you got an old woman. Get rid of her, however you want. That's your source. What's important is that you want the duck. I want 50 grand. Do we play? Well, no, I... Wait. Effie. I thought we had an audience the other side of the door. Dave, what were you... Shut up. Save it, Effie. This is business. Easiest money of the season. Well, if you're ready to talk business, we'll go and talk to my client, Mr. Spade. Now. Then let's go. Hey, what I heard you say. You did. Oh, Sam. You've known me a long time, Effie. But maybe you don't know me. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. The car that drove us down the peninsula was brand new. I could tell by the way the upholstery smelled and the careful way the driver handled it. O'Rourke, the lawyer, sat up front and I sat in the back, squeezed between two gunners. The gun muzzle stuck into my ribs told me all I needed to know about them. The rest of it I had to guess at. Time is hard to judge when you're blindfolded, but there's only one main road out of San Francisco by land. And I know the towns and stops along it fairly well. About 20 miles out of the city, the car turned off the main highway onto a gravel road. Five minutes later, the blindfold came off. The fog was so thick, I still couldn't see much. The gunners pushed me ahead of them into a shack that looked like a summer vacation cottage with a sign over the door that said, Buy the weed. A sallow, mean-looking little man with a heavily scarred face met us at the door. On his right arm, just above the wrist, was tattooed a small picture of a mallard duck. He glared at me, and then at O'Rourke. How come? I told you, don't come back without her. Heaven be my witness, Ducky. I did my utmost. Huh? It seems, Ducky, that Mr. Spade is interested in money. What money? Did you tell him we got the old lady? I did, sir. I am afraid we've misjudged Mr. Spade. In short, Ducky, Mr. Spade is not in the least altruistic. What does he want? Uh, uh, you had better tell him, Mr. Spade. 50,000 now, another 50 G's when I deliver the duck. A hundred G's is a lot of cash. You can afford it. Bugsy, bring in the old lady. Okay. Well, uh, I still wish that you'd explain to Mr. Morton. Sam! Well, it's high time. Do you know these men? This was a cute trick, Ducky, but it's going to cost you. The lady spoke to you, Spade. I told you it's going to cost you letting her see me here. And the longer she stands here staring at me, the more it's going to cost you. Sam, what is it? If I've done anything, it'll make you angry. Get her out of here! But Mr. Morton said you were going to call for me, Sam. I, I don't understand. There, there, now, my Don't. Uh, come along now. Don't you worry about it. I want to go home. Well, of course. I really want to go home. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Spade. You've broken that old lady's heart. Stop drooling. Watch your talk, Sonny. I ain't any sweet old lady. I don't have to use words when I talk to you, Ducky. You want to do anything to me because I got something you need. Okay. A hundred G's paid the way you said. Price has gone up. Huh? Kidnapping's a federal rap. I'm not taking any part of it. She don't know she was snatched. We told her we are from the DA's office, keeping her on ice as a witness. You'll find out different. I don't plan on settling down here. Oh, that's fine, but I have to go on living in this town with that old hand alive and clucking. It won't be easy. You mean you want we should knock off that sweet old lady? You're a little slow, Ducky, but you'll get there. I've met some lousy low-down heels in my day, but you're the lousiest low... Oh. Go on. Go on. I can take more of it at these prices. We ain't doing your dirty laundry, see? Then it's no dice. My price is a hundred grand. What if I say no? Then I turn over the duck to the federal boys. In that case, I don't care whether the old lady stays alive or not, because I'll be playing their game. Either you're in or you're out. Take it over, Morton. When you decide, you know where to reach me. Yeah. We'll know where to reach you. <laughs> It 
drove me back to town blindfolded. When they let me out of the car, all I could see, even without the blindfold, was the corner of Post and Carney. When a streetcar came along, I tossed a coin with it to get on it. I lied down on the tracks and let it run over me. Came up head, so I uh, tossed it again, and I got on instead. I fished in my pocket for a slug and came up with a folded slip of paper. It was the one Lola had handed me at Mr. Perrine's birthday party when they were passing out the parts for that screwy charade game. I unfolded it and glanced at it. Then I read it over very carefully. The writing was hard to make out, but what I could read of it said, Help me. That man Marty has followed me here to kill me. If I get out of here alive, Maxie's Arcade. I have a hundred dollars. I got off at Columbus and walked up to the international settlement where Maxie's Arcade does business. It's what they used to call a penny arcade before inflation set in. I dropped a nickel in a fortune-telling machine. Worried? Perplexed? Know thyself and your problems will vanish. A card came out that said, you're of a naturally deceitful and secretive character. Disloyalty brings its own punishment. It's never too late to mend. I tore up the card, kicked the machine, and that's when I saw it. a narrow little booth muffled in drapes and the sign over it said Salty Hawkins, tattoo artist. The card pinned to the curtain showed some typical tattoo designs, anchors, mermaids, fancy initials, but one had a hand-drawn picture pasted over it. It was a mallard duck. The same as the tattoo mark I'd noticed on Ducky Morden's wrist. I pulled the curtain aside and went in. Yes, sir, what can I do for you, mate? What do you know about the duck? All in your jib, mate. There's no freshwater birds here about. How about the new one you just put up in your cart outside? Oh, that one, eh? Now, whereabouts? On the arm? Two, three colour jobs. On a leg. Whereabouts? Her left knee. Well, that's right, mate. It was on her knee. Did she have you remove it for her? Right, guess that time, mate. Know why? Look, mate. If I did, I wouldn't be telling strangers about a secret. All right, where is she? Take it easy, mate. I haven't got time to take it easy, mate. Talk. Uh, you're a bad temper, gent. You come are. on, come on. I was going to tell you anyhow. She says to me, she says, if a man comes All right, in... shut up. Where is she? Right in the back room, mate. Who is it? Spade. Open up. Hello, Lola. Finally worked out your charade. Come on in, quick. Were you followed here? I wouldn't have come if I had been. How much do you know? They want you a hundred thousand bucks worth. You tell me why. You've seen Ducky Mordant? Yeah. Didn't he tell you? I want to hear it from you. Don't believe anything he says. Morning and I didn't even give me the time of day. He says he wants me back that way. He's a liar. How does he want you back? With rigid mortis, he wants me back. I'm taking an awful chance opening up to you like this. Let him catch me. They'd only kill me. Humane. If you was to let the DA people get at me, Ducky's mob would lay for me then if it took them years. And Oh, gee, you don't know, Sam. They... They torture girls. What that mob would do to me if I had to testify against okay, him. Okay, I take your word for that. Who are these DA people you're talking about? You never heard of Ducky Morton before? I heard his name. I thought he was knocked over when they had the big racket busting show in New York years ago. Yeah, I guess a lot of people thought that. It wasn't healthy to mention Ducky's name. What was the racket? Juke joints. Giving Mickeys to servicemen, rolling them. That's why the feds are helping the DA's office. They arrested hundreds of girls and held them as material witnesses. Only they wanted me most of all. I'd work the joints, you see, and... And then I was Ducky's girlfriend during the duration. Well, I'd think you'd be only too happy to tell what you know about him in court. Oh, gee, I would if I did, but you don't know. The DA's office say they'll give a girl protection, but how can they? What are you doing in San Francisco? Running away. Had my ticket on a boat. I was going to Honolulu. But they was watching the boats. So then I found this room out in Oakland. Mrs. Preen was real nice to me. I never thought they'd find me there. And then Marty showed up. Honestly, it was just a Mickey I put in his drink. Just like we used in the joints, I never knew it'd kill him. <laughs> You're a brave kid, Lola. Now, look, Ducky offered me a hundred grand to deliver you. Would you take a chance on me fighting it out with him for half of that? For 50 grand? Brother, where are we meeting him? O'Rourke's car was parked outside my apartment building where I had a hunch it would be. The two gunners picked us up at the door, unloaded my hardware, and marched us up the stairs. Ducky opened the door of my listen, apartment Ducky. and waved us inside. Listen, honey, you Ducky, go the wrong, plant see? outside, you two. Ducky, listen to me. Uh, sit down. You too, Lola. Ducky, I swear I never said a word. I'd never talk, Ducky, even if they chopped my head off. We'll take up your suggestion later. I got a conference on with Mr. Spade here. You bring the money? Don't crowd me. There's that other matter. 
the old lady. How about the old lady? I keep my word, Spade. You delivered the duck, okay. The way Jenny gave it out to O'Rourke was the old lady for the duck. But you ain't got no ethics. You see, you figured me wrong. I don't kill old ladies. You're gonna kill the duck. I ain't no old lady. No, you ain't. And you ain't gonna get any older. And neither are you, Spade. He wasn't kidding. He really meant to knock me over. And the gun he was gonna do it with got ready to speak its piece. I'd made my play too strong. The way this type of Gunsel thinks is simple, and I'd guessed it right. If you pressure him, they go the other way by instinct. But what I hadn't figured was that this killer had a heart of lettuce. He was going to cut me down to protect your mother from me. How do you like that? And I couldn't change my play now. The wheel was already spinning, and so was my head. I tried to brace myself and waited for the blast. Every little movement. <laughs> oh! oh, dear, I dropped the tree. This is Perrine. What are you doing here? Well, I was just making some coffee for the boys. Oh, dear, I've broken your cups. That's okay, Mother. We'll take care of it. Bugsy, pick it up. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bugsy. Well, I'm so glad you got my message, Sam. Didn't Effie come with you? Uh, yeah. I mean, no. I, oh, I, mean... I wanted to surprise you both together. I hope you don't mind my taking over the kitchen. It was so late and the boys were getting hungry, so I offered to make them coffee and hot cakes. Well, that was very nice of you. Uh, Mr. Morden, uh, put that pistol down for a moment and, and help me move this table out into the room. Huh? Oh, oh, sure, Mother. Thank you. Oh, we've had such a good time. I've never been up so late in my life. Mr. Bugsy and I played a game called Blackjack, and I won $50. Wait till Effie hears about that. <laughs> yeah, wait till she hears. I suppose Effie will come with Mr. Bundy. Bundy? Oh, yes. I remember that Effie said you and she are often down at his office at police headquarters late at night. So I phoned there. Uh, and... Mother. Yes, Mr. Morton? Did you say you phoned police headquarters? Oh, well, yes. That's where Mr. Bundy works. Mother. What did you tell Mr. Bundy? Well, just that you and the boys were here and that we were about to have some coffee. And he said he'd just love to come up and join us. And I said, do. And he said he would. With some of his boys. <laughs> <laughs> did I say something wrong? <laughs> no. No, Mom. Not at all. <laughs> all right, boys. Well, I believe that's Mr. Bundy now. <laughs> When the smoke cleared away, Ducky Morton and his hoods were playing dead duck for keeps in my living room rug. And that rug just came back from the cleaners, too. Dundee and the boys from Homicide took Lola Brent away with him. After it was all cleaned up, I found your mother out in the kitchen. Well, Sam, I just made another pot of coffee. <laughs> oh, it's okay, Mom. It's okay. It's all over now. I know. I know. I... I've been holding this back. Oh, say, I've never been so frightened in all my life. How does Effie stand it? You played it good, Mom. You played it real good. Did I? Was I as brave as Effie? Braver. And not only that, you got more brains. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Ahoy! It's me. Just came ashore. From what? A boat? A ship, Effie. A ship. Anything over 400 gross tons is a ship. Anybody knows that. Well, may I inquire what was your port of call? Calcutta. My, that was a quick trip. Well, Effie, I'll tell you. I got so homesick for you, I couldn't stand it, so I assembled my gear and jumped ship. Why, Sam, how sweet. A faster, gal. I'll be right down to dictate my report. <laughs> Voyage, Effie. I've been worried sick. Where have you been? On my way to Calcutta, sweetheart, where the dawn comes up like thunder. Sam, what are you talking about? Calcutta? And the flying fishes play. Ready, Effie? Sam, why did you want to go to Calcutta of all places? I didn't, Effie. I hate Calcutta. I was Shanghai. <sighs> to, uh, Mr. Philip J. Fogg, purser, S.S. Lurine. How do you spell that, Sam? L-U-R-E-N-E. Oh, that's pretty. Sam, how could you be shanghai in this day and age? I mean, isn't it against the law? Stow it, Effie. You're pumping bilge water. Sam, I am not. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596, when you have the time, regarding the Calcutta trunk caper. Dear Mr. Fogg, the following report will explain the enclosed voucher, which is a claim against your company for the amount of $500 and no cents. It will also answer any questions you might be asked concerning the recent unpleasantness on board your ship. It all started yesterday morning in San Francisco when my secretary announced briefly and caustically that there was a lady outside who wanted to talk to me. I judged that she was worth talking to. She was. Your secretary let me in. Well, I'm glad she did. What can I do for you? I'm Marsha Hopkins. I see. Mrs. Marsha Hopkins. I see. However, my husband is dead. I see. It's about my sister that I've come to you, Mr. Spade. I'm dreadfully worried about her. Uh, Who's your sister? Miss Constance Pendleton. And she's become involved with a a ne'er-do-well, a completely worthless scoundrel and a real foreign bluebeard. All three? It's one man, Mr. Spade. A Bulgarian, Major Andrea Rodnick. They're going to be married this afternoon, and I'm positive that his only interest is in her money. I'm convinced that he's going to kill her soon after the ceremony. He's done it to other wives in Europe. I've warned Constance and pleaded with her, done everything I could to stop it. But she's completely infatuated with him and refuses to listen to me. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? Prevent the marriage if you can. Get the truth about Rodnick's background and face Constance with it. Oh, Mr. Spade, in some way you've got to make her realize the seriousness of the situation. He's a ruthless character. <clears throat> well, do what I can, Mrs. Hopkins. Oh, thank you, Mr. Spade. Oh, I've felt so alone and helpless uh, until now. Oh, really? But you will do everything you can, won't you? We've got to save her life. She daubed at her eyes with a stamp-sized handkerchief, patted the red-gold hair of the temples nervously, smiled at me bravely, and swayed out. By telephone, I learned that the Vrodnik Pendleton marriage license had been issued four days before, and that on the same day, Constance Pendleton had withdrawn a savings account to the tune of $45,000. I'd always wanted to, so I did it. I uh, called at the Bulgarian consulate. What can I do on you? What do you know about Major Andrea Vrodnik? Ha! Huh? Andrea Vrodnik! On him we have hate, great sadness, with shame for the ground that walked under him. Oh? Ha! Andrea Vrodnik! Uh, why is he so popular? On the devil he is driven without horns. Six women he has killed. Six times he has insulted the police of Europe by refusing to confess. We have proof of the matters, but never can we prove the proof on him. Yeah, sometimes it goes that way. Ha! Never do we find the bodies of the six women. Only their money in the name of Andrea Vrodnik. <laughs> My pardon. Well, think nothing of it. You're, uh, you're just upset uh, on you. You're interested on him. Why? You go to Europe? No, uh, Vrodnik comes here. Ha! Here? Here on San Francisco? He marries again? So I'm told. Ha! 
Oh, by all the means, you must prevent it. Go to him, brave man. You do the world a service. Make a while in front of him. Even do you hang for it, your name will live. <laughs> Those valiant words goading me on, I left. The farther I got into the caper, the more it looked as if Marsh's fears for Constance Pendleton were very real and very well-founded. When uh, Constance opened the door of her hotel suite, I could see three trunks and a number of smaller pieces of luggage, all locked and ready to be taken out. Yes? Hey, Constance Pendleton? Yes? Uh, I'm a detective. My name is Spade. Detective? What do you want? I, uh, want to talk to you about that... Bluebeard, you're going to marry. Get out of here. Uh, you listen, I'll talk, and then I'll get out of here. I just left the Bulgarian consulate. Vrodnik has been accused of the murders of six women in Europe. Each of them were wealthy. Each of them married him, and each time Vrodnik came into all their money. Are you trying to blackmail me because of the lies about my fiancé's past? If you are, you're wasting your time. Well, no matter what I'm doing, I'm wasting my time. But to put you straight, your sister hired me, and I am now resigning. She's worried about you, not me. Then you should spend more time investigating your clients, Mr. Spade. You could have saved both of us some time. I have no sister. This is my wedding day. Goodbye, Mr. Spade. As I left the room, I maintained the stern facial expression I reserved for moments of great shock. But once outside the door, I allowed myself to be carried on the wave of rage and embarrassment for just a minute. And I kicked over two potted palms. As I uh, limped down the corridor, I was overtaken by none other than Marcia Hopkins. Did you see her? Let's talk about you first. Did you stop the marriage? Why did you really want that marriage stopped? But I told you. You told me you were her sister. Oh. She said she didn't have any sister. All right, Sam, I did lie to you about that. But I'll tell you who I really am. I don't want to know who you are. I don't ever want to know. All I want from you is my honestly earned fee and a brief but permanent goodbye. Oh, no, Sam, please listen to me. We've got to save that girl. I have $500. That's all I have. Would it be enough? What's your real name? Marshal Brodnick. Yes, he's my husband. I've been married to him for ten years. We've traveled all over Europe, and... I never knew where the money was coming from. He left me at times for two weeks or a month, and then when he'd come back, there'd be more money. I just realized that that's when he must have been killing those poor women. And I know that's what he's going to do this time. I just can't stand it. You've got to protect her. That should be easy. We'll let him get married and meet him at the door with a bigamy warrant. Then you will see me through this. I might. Oh. In my bag, there's $500. Take it. If we can't stop the marriage, then don't let him out of your sight. Not even for a minute. He's a beast, Sam. A beast. Marcia dropped me in front of the Beast's Hotel, and I climbed some fake marble steps to the second floor and knocked at his door. The man who opened it was heavy, handsome, in a swarthy, coarse sort of a way, and glowing conceit through two eyes. One monocled, one not. You are facing Major Andreev Rodnik, first Bulgarian horse. What want you? You are facing Saul Fox of the law firm of Fox, Smedley, Van Dusen, and Grip. You overwhelm yourself. I came here to warn you. If you go through with the marriage to Constance Pendleton, you're going to find yourself tangled with civil law. Warn Andreev Rodnik, who has personally led more saber charges then you have teeth in your skull. Yes. Who has personally split, slashed, and impaled on his own blade. More men than you have fingers and toes. You warn me? What is this talk? You're going to have a bigamy charge slapped on you five minutes after you slip her the ring. The warrant signed by Mrs. Marsha Vrodnik. Bigamy? Ha! <laughs> I laugh. This is not bigamy. Marsha's your wife, isn't she? That bigamy was committed when I married her. I had another wife then. You call yourself a lawyer, then you know that only the second marriage is bigamy. The ones following that are nothing, nothing but interludes. Okay, Major, go ahead and have your interlude. I'm just warning you. Oh, speaks. We are being married on Redwood City from a justice of the peace one hour previous. Then we are sailing through the SS Lurin at midnight with our honeymoon. Already a droshki awaits for the baggage and luggage. Go now before I'm losing my temper. If you're ever in Calcutta, look me up. Da! (laughs) 
I could see the direct approach was getting me nowhere, so I decided to proceed by stealth. I waited outside the building, and when he left, I tailed him. He made four stops at a second-hand store, a hardware store, a surgical supply house, and an undertaker supply house. At these places, he purchased the following items. An oversized steamer trunk, black with brass fittings, a large ball of rope twine, two large lead sash weights, a set of surgical instruments, and at the fourth and final stop, the undertaking supply, he bought two items, a 20-foot length of rubber tubing and a pump. He returned to the second-hand store with his other purchases, put them inside the trunk and ordered it sent up to Constance's hotel immediately, and thereupon it took himself to the same place. Marsha was waiting in the empty lobby when he went in. I crouched behind a pillar, turned up my hearing aid, and listened. Did you get the thing? Yes. Now listen, my darling, we must work fast. As soon as the trunk arrives, before she has a chance to get to yes, the telephone... Yes, yes, Andre, but please, no cutting in the apartment. As you wish, my darling. Now, you know what you have to do. Yes, While I'm getting her into the trunk, you'll change her clothes, put on her traveling dress, the hat with the... Wet. What is it? What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. Come, we must make haste. They made haste to the elevators, and I made haste to the row of house telephone booths around the corner and called Constance's room. Hello? Mrs. Rodnick? Speaking. Listen, get out of that room right away. Don't take the elevator, go down the stairs. I haven't got time to explain, and you haven't got time to listen. All those stories about your husband are true. He's going... Hello? Hello? Are you still on the line? My hand clawed out to the door handle, but I couldn't reach it. I felt as if the walls were closing in around me, and just before it got dark, I had the crazy notion that I was inside Brodnick's big black trunk with the brass fittings. I could still hear Constance's voice way off in the distance, somewhere in the direction of Calcutta. I tried to shout to her, to warn her, and then the lid closed over me. I shook my head, trying to get the bells out of there. Then I remembered where I was and what had happened. I was still wedged into the bottom of a phone booth where I'd slumped when Brodnick sat me. I got out of there somehow and grabbed the taxi for the Embarcadero. The time was 11.55. The SS Lorraine was scheduled to sail at midnight. I was no sooner across it than they hauled up the gangplank and the ship started moving out of the berth. I didn't know where she was bound for and I didn't much care. I checked the passenger list and found that Major and Mrs. Andrea Vrodnik were in stateroom 12, A deck. One minute later, I was hammering on the door of stateroom 12. The woman in Vrodnik's stateroom was Constance, and she was not in a trunk. I thought I told you to stop interfering in our affairs. Yeah, your husband told me to, but I didn't like the way he did it. Get out from here. Get out. I see you got your trunk in here where it's handy. Doesn't it make the stateroom kind of crowded? Why don't you give up, Mr. Spade? Two times already, you are twice a fool. Marsha has no money to pay you. Neither have I, even if she had the case. And believe me, she has not. Oh, why do you even bother talking to him, Andre? Mr. Well, Spade, will you go now, or will I have to call the steward and make a complaint against you? I went. I still thought Marsha Hopkins was somewhere on that ship. I still didn't like the look of that trunk. I found the purse's office and went in. You looked at me as if you thought I was a stowaway, Mr. Fogg, and you were right. Well, I'll have to make arrangements for you to ride back with a pilot, Mr. Spade. You realize, of course, that you're subject to a fine. Look, I don't want to do anything illegal. You know, it was uh, just an impulsive thing. Uh, couldn't I book a passage? Oh, well, there's the matter of your passport. We could arrange a visa and so on in St. Pedro. We'll put it in there in the morning. Well, that's good enough. Uh, how much is the fare? Oh, let me see. That's $483.87, exclusive of tax. Oh, hey, now, wait, I wasn't thinking of taking quite an extensive voyage, you know. I just wanted to get a little sea air. And, uh, how much to Pedro? Well, I'm afraid you don't understand, Mr. Spade. This is not a coastwise steamer. Our first official port of call is Calcutta. Yeah, I know, but Calcutta? That's in India. Well, uh, 
Uh, don't you have something a little less expensive, like uh, steerage or... Uh... There is only one stateroom available, number 14A deck. Take it or leave it. Okay, okay, Calcutta. After buying my passage to Calcutta, I had exactly 12 cents left. This I gave to the steward who showed me to my stateroom. He uh, thanked me, kicked me in the shins, and left. Out on deck, a tall, red-nosed old gentleman in knickerbockers and a yachting cap was taking a turn around the deck. With him was a face I'd seen in the morning lineup down at the Hall of Justice a dozen times. He was a hotel thief by profession, name of Norman Gorman. He knew me, too, but he didn't give me a tumble. I fell into step with him. Ah, see ya. <laughs> Nothing like it, am I right? <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's okay, but there's so much of it. Ah, uh, brisk, bracing, salt spray. Nothing like it. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, hey, Norman, my lad. I hate it. I hate boats. Suppose there was a fire on board. Fire? Oh, ridiculous. Is uh, this your first voyage to the Orient? Yeah. Uh, the inscrutable East. You've made this trip before? Oh, yes, indeed. I've worked this line. I, I mean, uh, yes, indeed. I make this voyage very often. Business interest out in India. Tea, you know. Runs in my family. Sturgis's golden orange in the little yellow package. Ever tried it? Uh, no, I never indulge. Huh? Don't drink tea, that's ridiculous. Commodore, I need a drink. I ain't happy. Suppose there was a fire on board here. Ah. Well, let's all have a drink. Yeah, suppose there was Shall a fire. Shall we? Come on, I'll shot you to a drink, sir. Uh, not me, Commodore. I, uh, just remember this is fire prevention week. <laughs> The nearest fire alarm to Brodnick State Room was on the companionway leading to the A-deck corridor. It was a glass-enclosed box with a small hammer hanging on a chain. I broke the glass and turned the key. In three seconds flat, the entire population of A-deck were shoving each other up the companionway, grabbing for life preservers as they went. The steward hammered on the door of State Room 12, opened it, shouted inside, and Brodnick and Constance reluctantly came out. I ducked inside, grabbed the handle of the trunk, and started dragging it. When I got it into my stateroom, I broke the lock and lifted the lid. It was Marsha, all right. There was just time to see that before the stateroom door flew open and the ship's officer stuck I, his head in. I said, what were you? Didn't you hear the alarm? Why, uh, no, I didn't. What's wrong? Never mind, Daddy. Take this life preserver. Get going Okay, now. okay. On. Don't touch me. It makes me nervous. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, the captain announced to the mob up on the deck that it was a false alarm, and the passengers drifted back to their cabins. I tried to look casual as I unlocked my stateroom door and walked in. Then I stopped trying. The trunk was still there, but the lid was standing open, and it was empty. I went down to B deck and found the cabin occupied by Norm and the Commodore. That door was locked, so I kicked it in. You could still see the marks on her wrists and ankles with the cord. It was the girl I had seen in the trunk. It was Marsha Hopkins, and she was very much alive. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was... Oh, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You've got to help me, Sam. Why should I help you? He's crazy. They're both. Crazy. It all depends on who's in the trunk, doesn't it, Marsha? When it was Constance, you didn't think he was so crazy. Oh, don't you understand? I had to pretend that I'd help him. He was going to kill her right there in the hotel room. I told him it was too dangerous. If anybody looked in the trunk, it would be safer if she was in there alive. So he finally agreed and said he'd wait until we got out to sea to kill her. And then he was Yeah, going I know to... about that. Oh, the idea was so awful, I, I couldn't stand it. I started to scream, and then he stuffed the gag in my mouth and tied me up. He must have used chloroform or something because the next thing I knew, I, I was in the trunk. And that little dark man was leaning over me. He and that old man with the knickers. They brought me here. <laughs> so they pulled a switch on you. You were the fall gal all along. Oh, you've got to believe me. It was the only way I could save her life. You're the only one I can turn to, Sam. That little thief and the old man, they'd deliver me dead if there was an extra $25 in it. Oh, say you'll help me, Sam. Please say it. Well, when you ask me like that, what... What else can I say? Oh, you do believe me, darling. You do believe me. 
Come on, let's get out of here. I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Please step back inside. <clears throat> I promised my associate, Mr. Gorman, that I would not allow this young lady to risk her life by leaving this cabin. You're getting into this cave at the wrong end, Commodore. It's wound up. They've bungled it. It's no good anymore. You may be right. But you understand my position, sir. I can't take any chances. You've uh, talked to Mr. Gorman? Norm? Yeah, I talked to him. He took you into his confidence? Stop making with the pistol, Commodore. You don't know how to use it anyway. Oh, heavens, Norm. You're, you're as white as a sheet. What is it? Oh, he, he's sick. Go go get a doctor. Yes, yes, indeed. Right away. Listen, Spade. Take her with you. Get out of here. I don't want no part of this. You got it bad, Norm. I'm sick, I tell you. The way I had it sized, this was a clean caper, a snatch. I figure the dame here's an heiress or something. Maybe they drop her off in L.A., correct some, connect some ransom and go on. I, I figure there was enough for all of us. Oh, but that creep, that Rodnick, he's crazy. He's a regular Jack the Ripper. Stop babbling, Norm. Tell me what happened, exactly what happened. I get a sinking feeling in my stomach every time I think about it. Well, I go in, see? He's very smooth, very businesslike. He offers me a drink. I accept it. He mixes a couple of highballs for me and the dame, and then he starts talking. I guess she don't know all about it before this, because she gets just sick as I do. First, I think he's kidding. Then he drags out this set of cutlery like a doctor uses to operate on people. Only he's got something else in mind. The portal, you understand? Oh, please. I don't want to hear anymore. Being as it's you he has in mind, I don't blame you. My, my stomach. Hey, Norm. Norm. Oh, here he is, the ship surgeon. Huh? Oh, dear me. What? 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 Uh, stand away from him, please. Help me get him into the bunk. Sure, Doctor. <sighs> Take the shade off that light, please. Ah, uh, yes, yes. He's dead, isn't he? Oh, yes, he's dead, of course. Who poisoned him? I didn't waste any time answering him. I grabbed him by the arm. Before he could object, I was pushing him up the companionway to A-deck. It was probably too late to save Constance's life if she'd drunk the same poison, and I was pretty sure she had, but if I was going to nail him for the murder of Constance, I had to get there before the evidence vanished. We got there just in time. I don't need to tell you what we saw, and I'd rather not. Brodnick rose slowly to his feet, clicked his heels military fashion, and bowed very low. Ah, the ship's surgeon. How opportune. Perhaps you could advise me, Doctor. After all, I am, in all honesty, even still a mere amateur at this sort of thing. After Vrodnik had been taken into custody, we took another turn around the deck. It was daylight, and the ship was lying to off San Pedro. This time, the fresh air really felt good. And so did Marcia. It's all over, Sam. Yes, sweetheart. It's all over. But not between us. Say it, Sam. Say it's not all over between us. How can it be? I knew it. I knew you felt the same way. All my life before, it's been like a terrible nightmare. Never really happened. But it did happen, sweetheart. Oh, but you can forget it, darling. Can't you? Please forget it. I'd like to, Marcia. I really would. Hold me close, Sam. Never let me go. You're beautiful. Is that all, Sam? Nothing else? Yeah. Lots else. That's why I think we better say goodbye right now. Because when I feel like this, I get foolish. And if I get foolish with you, I'm likely to wake up in a trunk someplace. <laughs> That, Mr. Fogg, is the true account of the Calcutta trunk caper. As my voyage was interrupted through no fault of my own, I trust you will advise your company to refund my passage minus the one-way trip to San Pedro. Uh, period, and a report. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duck. It is played by Howard Duck. It is played by Howard Duck. It is played... Listen now to The Adventures of Sam Spade, starring Howard Duff in The Convertible Caper. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. 
Sam, I knew you'd have the courage to come back and face it. Well, I'm back, Effie. What shall I face first? You didn't do something else, did you, Sam? Besides what? Besides running away with that woman in a stolen car. You're a little mixed up, Effie. The car was stolen from her. You mean it was her own car? Well, not exactly, Effie. You see, she stole it from somebody else, and then somebody stole it from her, and then I got it back for her. Well, it must have been quite a car to be worth all that trouble. Uh, it wasn't so much the car, Effie. It's... Party? Sam, I don't understand. Think it over, sweetheart. I'll be right down to dictate my report. <laughs> You. Can't you take no for an answer? And just what do you mean by that, Miss Perrine? Claw marks on your face. Wrong again, sweetheart. She said yes, I said no. Hence the scratches. I knew she was that type the minute she walked into this office. That ankle bracelet and green nail polish. Green nail polish. Well, cute colors. This one goes to homicide, Effie. Oh, not another murder, Sam. What else? <sighs> Two, Detective Lieutenant Sandy from Samuel Spade with uh, license number 127596. Subject, the convertible caper. Dear Dundee, it has been a dull morning, but just before lunchtime, things began to brighten up. Her clothes looked like money, unless they were wrapped around, looked even better. She eased herself into the chair I pushed up for her, rattled about a thousand bucks worth of charm bracelet at me, and after she'd arranged her legs, mouth, and eyes to our mutual satisfaction, she allowed me to hear the sound of her beautiful voice. I do not know whether you will be interested in my case or not, Mr. Spade. Put your mind at rest, Miss uh... Estrada. Miss Estrada. Who knows? Perhaps I am merely a waste of time. My time is your time as you stay in the States, Miss Estrada. Oh, you are very sympathetic, very kind. Yes. And from this, my automobile has been stolen. When and from where? Last night, after midnight, while I was checking in at the Hotel San Rafael, where I am staying, I foolishly left it parked outside with the keys in it. Have you reported us to the police? No. I suggest you do not. No. No? No. Well, why not? Because I stole it from another. I see. No, but you do not yet know all. If the police find the card and notify the one from whom I stole it, then that one will know that I am in San Francisco. And that's bad. Ah, oh, he's not so bad. If he finds out I am in San Francisco, then he will come here and kill me. That is why I must recover the car rapidly and without the police. You will be glad to help me. Be very pleasant, Mrs. Strata, but hot cars are not exactly in my line. You wish that I... I don't think anybody would murder you just for stealing his car. Oh, not for the car, no. Already he tried to kill me once, twice, three times. So I take the car and drive away rapidly. Away from where? Mexico State of Chihuahua, where this pig resides who wishes to murder me. Why? Oh, she drinks. She becomes a beast. He accuses me of... Look, look here on my shoulder, this car. Well, already he cuts me with a knife. Hmm. Uh-huh. Now you have seen something that changes your mind about me, huh? You see that I am sincere. Why, Mrs. Strada, I never had any doubt. Oh, please. I am without friends. You will call me Nietzsche, okay? Yes, indeed, Nietzsche. Bueno, now we are friends. Mm. In the car is sitting the pig. Hmm. Hey, what's this uh, pig's name? Pig is the only name I will honor him with. Pig. Pig. Mm. Hey, what makes a car is this? Leonza, you know this kind of car? Yeah, it's a foreign car. I've seen a few around. This must have set the pig back several thousand bucks. Ha! He steals everything. Listen, my darling, please notice. Around here is pink with blue fenders. Uh uh-uh, not anymore. That's the first thing a car thief changes, the paint job. Any other uh, distinguishing marks? Distinguishing marks? Yes. I think. Uh, it has a radio. You don't say. Uh huh. And it has. Two windshield wipers. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I'll buzz around, Mitya. If I find anything, I'll let you know. Uh, my fee is... Yes. Uh... <laughs> yes, uh, that, that is something else. I have no money. Oh, that's great. That's just great. But I am sincere. You said so. Look, my darling, keep this. It is worth very much. See? This little charm Malone. Platinum set with diamonds. Worth very much. You will keep it until I pay you, huh? Adios, Juan. Adios, Juan. 
She thrust the charm bracelet into my hand, bit me on the ear, and departed. I put a Band-Aid on it, ran some cold water over my head, poured myself a stooks like a bourbon, and examined the bracelet. The dangle she pointed out was a white metal disc with a monogram in diamonds, two uh, vertical bars with a horizontal one on top. It was the Greek letter pi, or the initials PT, depending on who had stolen it from whom. I knew it was at least worth my fee. I dropped it into my pocket and went out. My first stop was over on Mission. The sign on the building says, uh, Masterpiece Auto Painting, Joe Rembrandt, Proprietor. Sam, long time no see. Hello, Joe. Uh, got something you want painted? No, but I think you may have painted something I want. Sam, you know me. They drive them in the front. We spray the paint on them and push them out the back. No questions asked. That's quite a turnover, Joe. Yeah, we're going big time. Got the exclusive now for the syndicate work in the hill. Is that right? Yeah. What are you looking for, Sam? A murder car? Could be. It's a custom job. Foreign car, uh, the answer. Hey, here's what it looks like. Yeah, convertible. Sure, come in this morning. Two color job. Which two colors? Canary yellow body, baby blue fenders. Yeah, quite a car, Sam. Quite a snazzy heap. Heap, huh? Yeah. Is that what you want to know? It was. Happy Herman Heat was one of the biggest used car thieves in the city. As I got off the streetcar in front of Happy Herman's lot, a flash of canary yellow paint caught my eye. I strolled down between the rows of cars and found it. Yes, sir, Heat's the name. Happy Herman Heat. <laughs> Every car on this lot is in perfect mechanical condition. Take your choice. Kind of hard to choose, Herman. There's so many here. Yes, yes, sir. It takes a heap of heaps to make a heap of heaps. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that yellow job uh, with the blue fenders there? Uh, oh, yes, sir, but the, uh, the the motor in that car, it does need some work. Now, over here... Does it run? Uh, oh, yes, it'll run, but over now, here... this is more I... what I want. Let me try it. Uh... Sounds all right to me. Oh, idling, yes, but needs some work in the transmission of the differential. Mind if I drive it around the block? Well, the mechanics were just about to work on it. Besides this... Uh, I'm afraid this car is more than you care to invest. Well, let me try it out anyway. Here, I'll uh, leave it apart. I reached in my pocket for Meech's charm bracelet. He took one look at it, and his expression changed. Well, uh, why didn't you say so? No deposit is necessary. The car's yours. Drive it as far as you like. Thank you, Herman Heath. <laughs> I took him at his word. I put the magic bracelet in my pocket, drove back to O'Farrell Street, parked in front of the San Rafael Hotel, slipped the doorman a buck to wash it for me, and went on into the lobby. The desk clerk said that Senorita Estrada had checked out 30 minutes before, leaving no address. I found the house stick in the bar and asked him for a rundown. Yeah, I remember her, Sam. Very nice dish. Any callers signing? Yeah, two guys. Huh? She went out when they came. They've been back since. Who were they? You won't believe it, Sam. One of them was Tom Tom Carey. What's he doing in San Francisco? He's wanted for murder. And I don't know, but there must be plenty in it if he's brought him back across the border. He's staying here? Yeah. Room 613. Uh-huh. Do me a favor, will you, Tom? Anything at all, Sam. There's a car parked outside in the loading zone here. Stow it in the hotel garage for me, will you? Upstairs, as far out of sight as you can get it. I went upstairs and rang the buzzer at room 613. The door was opened by a little dark-complected man with hard eyes and Indian features. There was a mean-looking knife in his hand, but he put it away at a nod from Tom Tom Carey. How'd you find out I was in town? Not from Meacher. I don't know how much he told you, Sam, but if he told you this much, he was 11. It's a million-dollar caper. And you know some of the things I've done for less. What's in it for me? What'd she pay you? Nothing. She left this charm bracelet in hock. Now, boss... I caught him now. Shut up, Parker. Give me that person. Mine. Uh-uh. Watch it, Tom. Don't crowd me. I got something bigger than this or you wouldn't be here. All right, Sam, what do you want? I want to hear you talk. Hmm, I guess you know I've been down Mexico, eh? I'm listening. I got a little business down here, garage business. Running hot cars across the border in the state? <laughs> we cool them all. Little body work and his serial number. Like plastic surgery. Sounds like a good business. You shouldn't be neglecting it. You met the dame. She says you want to kill her. Sir, I was off my trout. I scared her. I didn't mean anything. I thought I could scare her into sticking around. 
I'll let Parker nick her shoulder a little bit. Oh, no, just a little bit. Yeah. I figured her wrong. I know that now. If I could see her for five minutes just to talk to her, I know it'd be okay. I can't help you, Tom Tom. I want to talk to her myself. Well, since she hasn't got a penny, only that car. She figures I'm peddling that. Not anymore. She already sold it? Some car thieves took it. She hired me to trace it. Look, yeah. Maybe broke in a strange country. I'd look good to her again. Here's a thousand bucks, Ken. Yeah. Oh, this is so no. sudden, Tom Tom. Nothing. nothing. When you see her again, give her that bracelet back, yeah? It was a present from me. And whatever you do, don't find that car. Okay, Tom Tom, it's a promise. Thank you. Only one thing I don't understand. You said it was a million dollar caper. I meant that. She's worth a million bucks to me, Sam. The girl, Tom Tom? Or the car? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked that question, Sam. I really do. <laughs> to the convertible caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. When Tom Tom Carey said a million dollar caper, he meant just that. He never risked a rap for less than a hundred grand, and no dame that ever lived was worth more to him than a hot mink coat. If Nietzsche wasn't the million dollar package, the car was. I didn't know what was in it, but Tom Tom, it might be diamonds, dope, smuggled Chinese, or just plain money. So I went back to the hotel garage. Number 1279. I climbed the long, curving ramp to the second floor and found the canary yellow De Anza convertible crowded in behind four ranks of cars at the rear of the building. I started to work on it. Nothing in the luggage trunk, nothing under the seats, under the upholstery, and the door panels, nothing anywhere. Then I got Piney Stover, and the two of us went over the second time. Ah, it's a cold lead, Sam. It's not, I know it's not. Now, think, Tiny, what's different about this car? Well, solider built than most, good body of work. I don't know. Hey, here's something. What? There's a hole punched out of this fender over here. About the size of a quarter. Let me see that. Yeah, right here. It curves under, see? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. What's that you got? Sound bracelet. Did you say this dangle on here was what was cut out of that fender? Let me see. It fits. Fits even the curve. Yeah. What does it mean, Sam? The dangle on the bracelet is solid platinum. Hey, Sam, are you trying to tell me the fender's on this heap of solid platinum? You got a pocket knife, Sam? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, it shines. Sam, is this a hot car? <laughs> I didn't answer him. I didn't have to. He looked in the gray-white gleam of the bracelet shine with a square of paint I'd scraped off the fender and answered the question himself. Meech's convertible was convertible in more ways than one. It was about the hottest car in San Francisco as of that moment. After I'd left the garage, I tried to phone Tom Tom, but he wasn't in. I had an uncomfortable feeling he was out looking for me. He was. As I stepped out of the phone booth, there was a rush of air past my left ear. A knife stuck in the wood, less than an inch west of him. Came out in the street and time to see him duck around the corner into an alley. I ran after him. I collared him and stood him up against the wall. Let me go. Let me go. I cut you down. What do you know about that car? What do you know about that car? Come on, talk or you get more of this. Uh, I don't know nothing. They don't tell me nothing. Where's Meacher? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Meacher don't know nothing either. Only Tom Tom and... Tom Tom and who else? I don't talk no more. They cutting you in? I don't need no cut. The boss, he pays me good. Forty pesos. Sometimes more. Work for me and I'll cut you in. I cut you to pieces. The boss treats me good. Sure, you do all the dirty work. There's any trouble, you'll take the rap. What means rap? They put you in a little room and squirt gas in you. You fall dead. Gas? Tom Tom do this? He does indeed. Venga. Come. I thank you to see the man. Su nombre es I think he will be very happy to see you. The place Paco took me to was about as high on Russian Hill as you can get. The house was old, faced in brownstone, and had a high iron fence around it. And the gate was the main plate, H. H. Lovelace. When I opened it to go in, I noticed that Paco was no longer with me. Oh, Mr. Spade, come in, come in. The gray-haired gentleman who greeted me was wearing a wing collar, a carnation, and a very distinguished air. 
I could hardly believe it, but he was definitely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, none other than the one and only Happy Herman Heap. Well, Mr. Spade, I see that you're surprised. I'm overwhelmed, uh, Mr. Heap. Uh, lovely. Lovelace, that is the correct name. For my uh, first avocation, I selected my first and second names, the HH, you know. My full name is Herman Heap Lovelace. About that car, Mr. Spade. Uh, yeah, about that. I must own that you outwitted me. I was rather proud of my little device, the disc on the charm bracelet, you know. When you showed it to me at the, uh, my business establishment, I naturally thought you were authorized to take the car. Yeah, naturally. However, I'm not averse to enterprise in a young man, and I'm prepared to pay for my blunder. You said a million I still couldn't accept, Mr. Lovelace. Oh, why not? I was hired to recover that car for my client. It's not mine to sell. Well, it's certainly not hers. I don't care whose it is. All I know is that my client's life is in danger, and it has uh, something to do with that car. Miss Estrada? Yeah. Excuse me one moment. Please arrive. Hello, Papa. That's all she said. Then she stood there looking at me in that way that made you not care who she was double-crossing or why. Then she turned to uh, Lovelace, alias Herman Heap. How much does he know? Alas, everything, I fear. He has agreed to our terms? Yes. Good. I must have my bracelet back now, Sam. Sure, it's right here in my... I reached in my coat pocket for the charm bracelet she'd given me to keep for it. It wasn't there. It wasn't in any of my pockets. I guessed that it was in one of Paco's pockets. Mitya watched me fumbling, her eyes blazing with anger. Fool, you have lost it. We are helpless without that. I thought it was the car you wanted. Please, please, one thing at a time. I suggest that we first gain possession of the car. Yes, Lovelace, you are right. First, the car. <laughs> Ah, yes. This is the car at last. A princess in vulgar raiment, but still a princess. No royal coach carrying a king to a coronation ever held such riches. I just talk too much. Oh, I do. Well, take your place at the wheel, Mitchell. We shall drive out of here into a splendid future. Uh, after you, Mr. Spade. No, no, Mr. Heath. After you. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it, that with all my varied interests, I've never learned to drive a car. That are too buckle, viejo. You uh, seem kind of shaky, Misha. Are you sure you can handle the car down the ramp? I'm very good driver, Waffle. Misha, stop. Put on your brakes. There's a man coming up the ramp. Please. He was dead before I got to him. As I leaned over him, I saw the bracelet lying beside his hand. I picked it up and walked back to the car. Nietzsche and Herman Heap Lovelace were sitting in stony silence, glaring at each other. Is he dead? Yeah. Was the bracelet on him? I didn't look. Lovelace, go and frisk him. Oh, must I? It, it's very distasteful to me. Uh, come, Mr. Spade. You fool. We trust this detective. Go on. Very well. Get in, Sam. Get in. We leave him here. What's the matter? Is something wrong? Oh, uh, nothing at all. Come back here! This is an outbreak! I mean, make... Come back here, I say! Please, Harpo. Have cigarettes. Sure, sure. Here you are. Gracias. De nada. <laughs> I, um, uh, I saw you pick up the bracelet. I meant that you should share it with me. That is why I gave you the bracelet in the first place. I liked you. Couldn't have been because you were safe as long as Tom Tom didn't know where the bracelet was, and if you had to kill somebody for it, it would be me. Please, Carita, what does it matter now? We are together, we have the car, we have the bracelet, and the pig is dead. That's what worries me. Oh, surely you do not think I meant to kill him. Of course not. Your foot just slipped. You stepped in the gas by accident. Yes. Yes, that was you. It won't stick, sweetheart. Not with me. But with the police? My story won't help you. I don't know enough. Oh? Then I tell you everything. I was with Tom Tom for a year. I hated him 365 days. I tried to run away. Always that Paco came out and brought me back. Then, Senor Lovelace came with the car. Senor Lovelace had much money, but he could not take it from the country. So he bought, 
sold platinum. Some he received from refugees who had sent their fortunes abroad in that form. Mm. But there was no safe way to get it across the border. So for a cut, Tom Tom had the platinum made into fenders and welded onto the car. Why was the bracelet so important? It was too dangerous for Lovelace to bargain directly. Tom Tom was to get the money for the platinum and give the little piece of the fender as a token. Yeah. Lovelace would know who to give the car to when they showed it to him. That's why he let me drive the car off the lot, huh? Oh, I don't care, darling, even if you try to steal it. Now we understand each other, no? You are tough, too. Tougher than Tom Tom, I think. Well, well. Now we have everything for ourselves, you and me. What do we care for the others, huh? You make a good pitch, sweetheart. You look beautiful while you're making it. But I don't like you driving. What do you mean? Pull over. I'm driving this heap back to the city. No. I said pull over. I won't let you do it. I don't care what happens. Take it easy. You want to kill us both? Sure, I will kill us both. We die together or we live together. Yes or no? You're not. Answer me. The answer is no. Well, no, you will see. I mean what I say. Fog thinned out just as we rounded a bend in the road. There was a point ahead with a sheer 300 foot drop of the sea. She jerked the car away from the pavement and steered straight at it. I grabbed the wheel and twisted it. The car skidded on gravel and slid sideways toward the cliff. I got the door open and tried to yank her out with me. She held on and kicked me until I rolled free. looked very beautiful when I saw her for the last time. And the flashy convertible was a pile of junk. Very expensive junk, but junk all the same. I understand the federal men have confiscated the platinum and are holding Lovelace for questioning. I doubt if he'll crack. Nobody can embarrass a used car salesman. Period. End of report. Sam, do you really like this racket we're in? I hate it. So do I. But don't let ever go into any other rack. It's a promise, sweetheart. Why, I'll never know. I'll meet you. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, was written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Tonight's program was directed by Elliot Lewis. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, I got it. Got what, my pet? A bank book, Sam. Well, you must advertise in the lost and found right away, Effie, and find the owner. There might be sickness in the family. Oh, but it's your bank book, Sam. What? Uh-huh, it has your name on it. Samuel Spade, account number it's four. It's a forgery. Somebody's trying to pin something on me. Lock it up and don't touch it until I get there. Oh, all right. Did you make a lot of money on this one, too? Got the check right in my pocket, 500 bucks. Oh, Sam, we're making more money than a movie star. Well, almost. And all honestly, too. Hmm. 600 last week and 500 this week. Yeah, how about that? And life gives a three-page spread to I Spy Molten. But uh, we mustn't let it turn our heads, Effie. No. We gotta stay in there pitching. I'll be right down to pitch my report on the Adam Fig caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You've heard the saying, you never know until you try. Well, you'll never know how handsome your hair can look until you try Wild Root Cream Oil. See for yourself how neatly and naturally Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair. 
Note how effectively it relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. You can get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic in either the big economy-sized bottle or the handy tube. Or you can ask your barber to use it on your hair. But by all means, try it. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Love it. Well, we got to watch these expenses, Effie. There, you know, there's always something. Yes, but this will be saving. It saves confusion. It saves fretting. Mm-hmm. Now, this gadget here, what is it? It's a mini robot. <coughs> a what about? It's for busy men like yourself, Sam, so you don't have to burden your mind with petty details. You see, it has this dial on it, yeah. right here. And you drop these little cards in this slot. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about that. That's for me to take care of. Oh, good. Then, when you come into the office, and supposing you have an appointment with Mr. Jones at 2 o'clock, and you forgot about it. You just dial 2 o'clock, and the little card pops out. And it says, Mr. Jones on it. How do I remember to dial 2 o'clock? Oh. Well, maybe it's in the instruction book. But anyway, now go ahead, Sam, please. The card's right in there. Now, dial 2 o'clock. Go on, Sam. Uh, let's see. Uh... Just like a telephone, Sam. Uh-huh. Now what do I do? Well, give it time, Sam. It's thinking. I must have forgotten uh, Jones, Mr. Jones. Mm-hmm. Effie, do you think it's dead? Sam, I don't understand it. It was working perfectly. Well, I'll take it straight back first thing in the morning. You'll have to. It'll never find the way itself. You got your book, sweetheart? Yes, Sam, I... <laughs> I don't understand. It was working perfectly. Well, that's all right, ago. honey. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Date, October 5, 1947, to Hillary Exxon Esquire from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Oh, Jim, oh honey, it's only a memo robot. <laughs> Subject, the Adam Fig Caper. Dear Mr. Exxon, October 2nd in San Francisco was one of those days that you see blown off the calendar by a gust of wind in the movies to denote the time is passing. It was a day for scraping off the minutes with a fingernail file and wondering whether the display ad I'd paid for in the classified section of the phone book wasn't just a waste of money. It certainly wasn't the day I'd expect a leprechaun to walk into my office. He uh, said his name was Adam Fake. He said he was the butler at Exxon Manor in Los Nidos. The limousine, Mr. Spade, is waiting to take you away. We mustn't keep them waiting, must we? Of course we mustn't, uh... Who mustn't we? Why, Mr. Hillary, of course, sir. Oh, Mr. Hillary. And old Mr. Exxon. Mm. The old gentleman is very ill. Sir. Uh, Dr. Feige's office is down the hall. Turn to your right, second door. Well, I assure you, sir, that Mr. Exxon is the best of medical care. Your duty will be simple to prevent his death. Uh, do I donate blood or just frighten away the evil spirits? Oh, it isn't quite that, sir. Someone is trying to kill Mr. Exxon. He's a very sick man, and I'm sure he'd prefer dying from natural causes. Uh-huh. I get $25 a day in expenses. Uh, here is an ample amount in advance, sir. But you should know, sir, that the old man is a nasty, cantankerous, villainous, crooked, insidious... Five hundred dollars? Please, Fig, you're talking about the man I love. <laughs> Los Nidos was at least an overnight caper, so on my way out, my lovely and charming secretary, Miss Perrine, handed me a brown paper bag which contained A, one pair of socks, darned, B, one shirt, ironed, and C the apple which she always polishes for me the night before. We arrived at your large, southern-style mansion two hours later. Pig! Oh, Pig, where the devil have you been? To the city, sir. I can't find the keys to the liquor closet. Where are all the maids? What happened to that cook we hired yesterday? Who is this man, and why is he wearing that necktie? This is Mr. Spade, sir, the detective. Oh, oh, uh, I'm Hillary Exxon. Come in, come in, please. Go on upstairs, Fig. See what that girl is doing to my father. I don't believe she's in this at all. Very good, sir. In here, Mr. Spade. Pardon the condition of the house. The old man has been firing the servants again. Your father, you mean? Yes, yes. Every time he gets shot at, he fires all the servants. He gets shot at pretty often? About once a year. In the fall. Mm -hmm. You always hire a detective? Uh, No. 
Oh, dear. I'm not keeping you up, am I? No, no, excuse me, please. It's, it's much worse this time. I can't get any sleep. Guns going off in the middle of the night. The whole household disturbed. When and where was he last shot at? Yesterday morning at about half past one. I dug the bullet out of the woodwork myself, a thirty-eight caliber, embedded in the door frame that leads to Miss Kaywood's room. Oh, uh, that, uh, that's his nurse. Was she with him at the time? No. No, Dad sleeps like a baby, full of sedatives, she sees to that. Shot come from outside? Yes, yes, but we found nobody on the grounds. No traces of anybody. I don't know whether Dad knows who shot at him or not. He's such a closed mouth old devil. You don't uh, care very much for your father, do you? To be frank, Mr. Spade, if hating weren't such an effort, I would despise him. He is without a doubt... Well, listen, listen. There, there, that's just a sample. Well, come on, come on, let's see what's eating him now. Get out! I'm I'm quitting. I'm quitting, Mr. Exxon. I can't stand it another minute. Yelling, screaming, throwing things at You must have done something to set him off. I didn't, I tell you, I didn't. This is Mr. Spade, Miss Kaywood. Oh, a detective. Oh. Will it make you happier to know that I'm a private detective, uh, Miss Kaywood? Well, Mr. Spade, I only hope you can prevent a murder. If there's any way at all that I can help, I... Thanks. Can... I'll uh, see you downstairs after I've talked to the old man. You'd better go in alone, Spade. Oh, Miss Kaywood, <clears throat> do you have a throat spray downstairs? I seem to be congested. Oh, go away. Go away! Go away! Oh, <laughs> well... Wasting ammunition. Who are you? If you're a total stranger, come on in. Well, don't be afraid, son. Come on over where I can look at you. Uh, it's uh, hard to keep my eyes open. Oh, no, I mustn't do that. Mustn't do that. Oh, so you're the detective, eh? That's right, Pop. If you want to take a little nap or something, I'll come back later. Uh, oh, 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 what did I say just now? Come back later? No, 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 no. There's no reason for you to come back later. I'll say everything I have to say right now. The shot woke me. I didn't see anything. I don't know anything. I've got a million enemies. I can't remember the names of any of them. Why don't you try to remember? I could have them checked. You're wasting your time, Sonny. In my day, I've wiped out a hundred men, and I'll outlive anybody who's gunning for me now. You must be proud of your past, huh? Proud? Uh, Sonny... A past like mine is the finest thing an old man can have. I've swindled my partners and betrayed my friends. I've turned state's evidence just (coughs) to see my associate get sent up for 20 years. And they say my wife died under peculiar circumstances and I got rich off her insurance. Now I'm done talking. (coughs) Uh, Oh, do me a favor, son, please. I've got to get a half hour, 20 minutes sleep alone. You'll keep them out, everybody. Please, will you? Sure, sure, Pop. Uh, Go ahead. Go on, sleep. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. He closed his eyes, rolled over, and fell into a heavy sleep. I stood there a moment, looking down at the frail, wasted old body. Then I cased the room. In digging the bullet out of the door, Hillary had done a good job of ruining any chance there might have been of proving the direction it had come from. I strolled out on the balcony. It was a pretty night. I lit a cigarette and took it in. Then I heard the door open and close softly behind me. Nurse Kaywood was at your father's bedside. She was filling a hypodermic from a small vial of bluish liquid. He didn't awaken when she jabbed it into his arm. Then she saw me standing in the doorway. She hastily dropped the medicine vial into her uniform pocket and came around the bed to meet me. Oh, oh Mr. Spade, oh, thank heaven, my... Why, when I saw you standing there in the half-night, I thought you might be... Thought I was who? Why, the the man who fired the shot. It was a man? Well, I don't know. I I didn't see it happened. I just assumed that... You shouldn't have done it. I warned you, Eleanor. Oh, uh, we're we're disturbing him. Let's talk outside. Okay. Oh, it's good to breathe something besides sick room air. I thought you got used to things like that in your profession. Why are you so unfriendly, Mr. Spade? Nurses are human, aren't detectives? Try me, sweetheart. Oh, I know what you're thinking of me. But after a week in this horrible house, that that poor old man, he's frightened. He's really frightened. What of? By, by the shots. Thirty-eight caliber or hypodermic? Surely you don't think that I... He's supposed to be under sedatives. The, the doctor's orders... Sorry, he... sweetheart. It's my job to suspect everybody. Can't you forget your job? 
even for a moment. Sure. Sure, if you don't mind the fact that I know you're a liar, that I'd make book you didn't come here primarily as a nurse, and what's worse, your act's not even convincing. Oh. Is it that bad, Sam? Yeah. Almost bad enough to be good. Come here. Oh, I hate you. <laughs> It was a very satisfactory love scene for both of us. For reasons of her own, Barbara wanted to keep me out of that sick room for a while, and she did. For reasons of my own, I wanted to get that medicine file out of her uniform pocket, and I did. Then, as suddenly as we had fallen into love, we fell out again. After she'd gone to her room, I went back to my sentry duty around the house. Under a light on the front veranda, I examined the bottle from which Barbara had taken the injection for your father. It was labeled sodium thanatol and had been dispensed by a firm called Ibis Chemicals Limited in Cairo, Egypt. A screen filled the house, high and frenzied. I started running toward Barbara Kaywood's room. I slammed the terrace door open and found the light switch. Barbara was sitting upright in the center of a bed. Her face jerked up so abruptly that it seemed her neck had snapped. She clutched both hands to her chest and fell face down among the bedclothes, staining them with her blood. I don't know whether I went through, over, or around the screen that stood between her room and the old man's. I circled Exxon's bed. He lay on the floor on his side facing the window. I went outside. A 38 automatic lay on the ground a few yards away from the building. I put that into my pocket and listened. No shadows moving. Nothing. Then he was on me. Before I could be sure, he wasn't a medium-sized tree. Oh, yeah. ah, break your back. Be the light. The warm stuff on my cheek might have been the thing's blood or mine. It gathered me up and bent me back and tore at my throat. <laughs> then I remembered that hands are stronger than fingers. I started with his thumbs. <laughs> he lay there for a moment. Then his huge body began to twitch. He was holding his fingers and sobbing like a baby. I pulled him up to his feet and poked him in the back with the flat of my hand. I followed him through an opening in the hedges and down a long, pitch-dark lane toward the lights of a squat brick house set on the top of a slight rise. As we approached it, a door opened and light streamed out onto the porch. The tall man framed in the doorway was the last person in the world I expected to see. Ah, oh, Marcus, you brought it. Oh, master, very delightful service, but have much pain in fingers. Always <laughs> complaining, Marcus. Welcome, Mr. Spade. Come in, my dear fellow. Come in. I've been expecting you. Tell me, fortune. By, 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 uh, 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 blackmailing me. <laughs> and if you don't, uh, remit, Exxon could have you booked for forgery, uh, blackmail, definition of character. Oh, my, uh... my, my dear fellow, please. This, this, this is most painful. But if I had but the, the original letter, I could destroy it and go back to the felt. Ah, oh, the felt. What happened to it? Well, that fig, that, 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 that stinker stole it. He burgled my home. Are you uh, taking pot shots at old Exxon? Well, don't be a fool, man. I want Exxon to stay alive. I must find out some part of his life which will have an exchange value that will cancel out what he has on me. Uh, by the way, old thing, uh, you met Miss Kaywood. Mm-hmm. At the present moment, she's milking me for $150 a day. Oh? She's supposed to go to the old man, by whatever means necessary, into talking about his past. And that information she is to bring to me. Well, that ought to be easy. Exxon brags about his past. Now, so far, I've learned that Hillary Exxon stole two heifers of the livestock show in Abilene in 1906. <laughs> I feel for you, Captain. I wouldn't get much on the uh, current market, would it? My dear fellow, I have a, I have a proposition to make to you. Should you ferret out anything that would be of value to me, I'll reward you handsomely. Well, maybe something can be arranged, Captain. Good, excellent. May I have your word on that? Well, there isn't much time, Captain. I'd uh, better trot on back. I'll show you to the door, sir. And let me warn you, Mr. Spade, for your own good, should you ever hear the thrum of Ibis wings, run, flee. I assured him that I would heed his warning, bade him good night, and started back down the lane in the direction of Axon Manor. Business was going on as usual. There were no shots this time, only the screen. When I got to Barbara's room, you and Adam were standing at a bedside trying to quiet it down. Well, Mr. Spade, is this the way you guard the house against intruders? 
Where have you been? Ask Adam. What does he mean by that thing? I'm sure I don't know, sir. I've not left the house. What happened here? Oh, she woke up screaming. She said someone had come into the room and torn off her bandages. A nightmare, of course. Please, I want to talk to Mr. Spade alone. Oh, please, please go. Adam, you go, too. Please, Hillary, you go, too. Good. Some questions I want to ask you, sweetheart, alone. Oh, but look here, Spade, look here. She just had a terrific shock. She shouldn't be qu- uh, questioned. Well, the, the code of detective transcends that of the medical, Mr. Hillary. Huh? Perhaps he should have a few minutes alone with Miss Kaywood. Oh, very well, very well. I, I suppose he's no best. Uh, remember what the doctor said, Miss Barbara. Not too much exertion. What happened, Barbara? Well, it, it could have been a dream. Somebody was standing over me in the darkness and peering down at me. And then he started to rip off my bandages and I screamed. And when Fig came into the room and, and he turned on the lights, he was gone. It, it could have been a dream, Sam, and I, I could have been clawing at the bandages myself in, in my sleep. But you weren't. It wasn't a dream. I've been talking to Captain Sherry. And then I thought... Oh, oh well, how much do you know? That you've been feeding the old man truth, sir, and beginning to talk in his sleep. Oh. How much talking has he done? Well, plenty. How much have you told Sherry? Well, just as little as possible. Why? Because, Sam, if, if we can keep that old man alive and out of jail long enough to sell what we know to Sherry for what it's really worth, we'd be fools not to do it. What makes you so sure you'll stay alive long enough to collect, sweetheart? Well, because you're going to help me, aren't you, Sam? So I helped her, but not for the reason she thought. I made a lot of noise leaving her room and going to mine. Going back, I didn't wear any shoes. I slipped into a clothes press in her room so quietly that even she didn't hear me. I left the door slightly ajar and waited. Time passed, and I was stiff from standing still. It happened at about 3 a.m. The feverish glare of his eyes told me that the threat of the gun in my hands meant nothing to him. I jumped to his side, twisted the knife away from him, picked him up in my arms and carried him, kicking, clawing and swearing, back to his bed. He lay there, breathing hard. Then he smiled. You're a smart one, Sonny. You had me figured out the first time you came in here, didn't you? Not quite, Mr. Rexon. The gun under your window was the clincher. That gun? Sure. I had it under my pillow all the time. I got tired of shooting into door frames. Look, you're dying, Mr. Rexon. There's no use trying to make up stories now. <laughs> you're right, Sonny. I knew that nurse would sit up in bed after I fired tonight. And then I let her have it right through the screen. Why? You know why well enough. She was doping me up and sneaking in here at night listening to what I was babbling about. Maybe you weren't saying anything important, Mr. Exxon. I might have, Sonny. I might have. Fourteen years ago, I killed my wife. I wanted to carry the secret to my grave. (laughs) You nearly made it at that. Uh, Mr. Spade! What's happened? Is he dead? He's dead. Did he say anything, sir? Did he confess anything? You must tell me if he said anything. I didn't hear him say a word. Ah, well. Hmm. Yeah, Mr. Spade. Charged with a certain texture, a significant quality. There's a certain smell, yes. Ah, an omen. You can inhale it, sir. Journey thou to Nairobi on the felt. Tarry seven days, and you will collect the fabulous golden skull of Wizami, king of the Bojamas. Aha! Marcus! Yes, Master. Unhook the hooker! Pack the marmalade! We are off to the felt! <laughs> Just then, a flock of birds broke across the horizon, screaming. There must have been thousands of them, but not Ibis, Mr. Exxon. Vultures. I suppose if you're going to pay any attention to omens, it's a good thing to know your birds. Period. End of report. Right now, I have something to say to every man who doesn't use a hair tonic, to every man who says, I don't believe in it or I don't need it. That all depends on what you mean when you say hair tonic. 
If you mean the old-fashioned greasy kind that leaves your hair smelling like a perfume factory, you're absolutely right. But remember, Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic is nothing like that. Wild Root Cream Oil is an entirely new kind of hair grooming preparation. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil, and it contains soothing lanolin that's like the oil of your skin. Most important, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally, never leaves your hair sticky or greasy. Get the big economy size bottle and the handy new tube that's economical, easy to pack when you travel, and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay, get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, Effie, we, uh... Sam! The memo robot worked after all. I told you it would. Yeah, it just takes a little time, sweetheart. Oh! Read the card, Sam. Now, you see? You'd know you were supposed to see Mr. Jones at 2 o'clock. Isn't it wonderful? Well, this card doesn't even mention Jones. Huh? What does it say, Sam? Well, it says, uh, Journey Thou to Friskin's Drugstore, wager $5 on Ira W. in the third at Belmont Park. Oh, Sam, it's psychic. Tarry but a moment. Yes? Thou wilt lose five bucks. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy, reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.